CataractCoach.com podcast episode number 22 with Dr. John Hovanesian. John's an ophthalmologist who is a cornea and cataract refractive surgeon in Orange County, California. And he also is on the podium a lot. You've seen his name in a lot of the meetings. You've seen his book. He has a beautiful book about how to do pterygium surgery. And he has a passion, of course, for ophthalmology like we all do. He also works extensively with industry far more than most ophthalmologists I know. And he's going to share his insights there as to what's that like and what his path in ophthalmology has been. How does he give back? What are his interests there in charitable teaching and giving and doing mission charity surgery trips? We'll go into all those details. It's a fascinating conversation. I've known John since he was a cornea fellow and I was a first year resident way more than 20 years ago. And ever since then, I always knew he was someone special. Check it out. Welcome, guys, to our Cataract Coach Podcast, and today I have a very special guest, one of my absolute idols and mentors in the ophthalmology world. John Hovanesian is an ophthalmologist doing cataract, cornea, refractive, practicing here in Orange County and, U- and also a professor at UCLA. He is also a worldwide teacher and leader in the ophthalmology space. You've seen his name in Ocular Surgery News, on the podium in probably many different meetings, And he just has so much information to offer, including how to get these young 30 and 40 something year old ophthalmologists on the podium. How for you, how can you start on your path to become the next key opinion leader in ophthalmology? So John, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to be with you today. We're going to have an amazing time. Well, what a pleasure to be here, Uday. I have uh, been a fan of yours for as long as I've known you, which is uh, since you were a first-year resident at, at uh, Jules Stein. I know. No, no one wants to admit this, but John, <laughs> I've known you like 26 years. Yeah. When yeah, I, was a fir- right. I was a first-year resident in 1997, you were a cornea yeah. fellow. Yeah. Back then, when you, you did a two-year cornea fellow, that's no yeah. joke. <laughs> and I just, what I loved about you was, as, as I was joking about earlier, I was that first year ophthalmology resident who could barely spell ophthalmology and barely knew how to turn on a slit lamp. And you still took me under your wing and offered me so much guidance and teaching. It was such an incredible gift to me. Well, you're very kind. You were a, a remarkable resident from the beginning, Uday. And I, I think anybody who worked with you and, and your classmates all saw that, recognized that you had tremendous talent. And, uh, and that shows now in, in the incredible teaching that you've done you know, it started at UCLA for those residents where you've been so very popular as a faculty member, but now your audience is global. And, uh, yeah. you, you know, you, you have amassed a true reference uh, for cataract surgery through Cataract Coach that uh, I use if I want to look up, hey, what should I be thinking about in this kind of unique case that I haven't done in a while? Uh, it's all right there in a concise few minute video that uh, has great video to support it. So, Congratulations on what you've created. It's really uh, tremendous for our specialty. Oh, thank you. It's a labor of love, obviously, to have a new video every day. Today, we're at like something like 1,870 videos. Later this wow. year, we'll hit 2,000 videos. So it's a crazy number. And I, I, just, I still can't believe that we've accomplished this. Yeah. But, well, yeah, you, you know, the neat part in ophthalmology is, you know, we all learn from each other. We yeah, really sure. do. And I just remember, even recently, as, of, as, as early as early this year, I had a trigium case to do. And I said, you know, I haven't done a trigium in a while. I know it's easy. The first year residents do them. But there's got to be like more of an elevated art form of doing a trigium. So I read your book. I got a copy of your book about trigium surgery. And it is really a different level. It's uh, well. There's a few different techniques in there, and uh, most of the common ones that are used today are are uh, you know well described, and we've got videos that support them. And so I'm you know honored to have been able to contribute a little bit to teaching in that way. So I'm glad you were able to use it. That's nice. No, it's it's absolutely brilliant. And we've obviously we featured a video of yours before about cataract surgery with yeah. a torque lens on cataract coach before, and that was actually absolutely fantastic. It was actually. You were very precocious. You were ahead of your time. You were talking about things that I routinely do now every day, but you did them like a couple of years ago, like interoperative guidance of where to line up the torque lens, you know, with a, the, with a microscope assisted heads up display. You were doing this years before most people were. Yeah, well, we all learn as we go, right? And we, you know, we use the available tools that we have in our OR. Fortunately, we've been 
you know, have pretty close access to industry, so I've had a chance to use a lot of things before they were widely available. And we all learn from that, right? Everything new that we try, some of it works, some of it doesn't work, but uh, we share it with each other and we, we all get better together. That's one of the great things that, and unique things I think about ophthalmology is that we're such a, uh, you know, a sharing specialty. And a lot of specialties, docs want to sort of keep their skills held close so that they have a unique uh, feature that they can offer patients can't. Ophthalmology is a very uh, open field, I think, where we, we tend to share. And that's one of the things I enjoy about it. Very collaborative. Oh, ophthalmology is amazing. I mean, I, I, like you, am thankful every day that I'm an ophthalmologist. I, like, I can't believe I got this lucky and fell into a field that gives me this level of pleasure. Yeah, you know, our patients like us because, we, first of all, we never make them stand on a scale. Um, <laughs> Right, you're the you're the best. Never do they have to take their clothes off, right? And uh, no, and, no, and we, no, no rectal exams. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's right. It's never part of our practices. Under no circumstances, an ophthalmologist is supposed to perform a rectal exam. And I, I'm I'm very grateful for that. And <laughs> and, uh, and yet we make a big difference in our patients' lives almost immediately. The the success of the procedures we perform, the precision is just. Uh, remarkable and getting better every year. So uh, we're we're truly privileged, truly privileged to do what we do. But, now, uh, uh, yeah, we're, listen, it's, it's a blessing. How did you fall into ophthalmology? You obviously you're brilliant. You went to med school. You did. How did you choose eyeballs over anything else in the body? Right, like all of us have some some story that led us right because it is an, it is an odd thing, isn't it? So as a kid, when I was little, I it, from the age of one and a half, my eyes crossed. And I had um, accommodative esotropia. So from the time I was a baby, I had an ophthalmologist, a pediatric ophthalmologist. Wow. And I was very lucky because although I had strabismus, uh, it was correctable with just glasses because it was an accommodative uh, uh, esotropia. Full correction of my hyperopia that I had, I was, uh, I was able to straighten my eyes and develop great stereoacuity. And you know the amazing thing? The guy who was my pediatric ophthalmologist from the time I was a baby is still practicing. Oh, that's awesome. Today is still practicing. His name is Conrad Giles. At least he was as of a year or so ago when I spoke to him. I wrote an article about him saying that you know, the title was the uh, the ophthalmologist who influenced me most because without wow. his help, right? Wow. Isn't that incredible? Without his help, I probably would have amblyopia in one eye. I'd right. Have great stereo acuity, great acuity in each eye and, uh, and, and never needed surgery. So... It, since that time, I had known in my mind that ophthalmology was a, you know, an incredible transformative field, um, and I had a mother who was a, you know, a good Armenian mother who kind of told me, John, you should be a doctor. Doctor would be a good, a good field for you. You know, it wasn't any of this today where we want to be touchy feely and ask kids what are they, what should they do. You know, what, what are their what are their strengths? Yeah. John, you should be a doctor. So I said, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> I can relate because my parents told me when I was growing up I said. They said, son, what? when you yeah. grow up, when you grow up, you can be any kind of doctor you want. Anything. <laughs> you pick your specialty. That's right. Right. So uh, when I was in, and, and she, and she had, had told me all, all growing up that, look, ophthalmology is a wonderful specialty as well. So she didn't even give me the freedom that your parents gave you. <laughs> Tell me quite that, though. She said, you know, pick your specialty, something you want to do. When I was in my third year of med school, that's when you get to do rotations and things, right? And um, I did, I, I thought growing up that I'd want to be a heart surgeon. I thought the coolest thing you could do would be to transplant the heart, to give someone sure. a new heart, to give them a new life. And did a rotation in first vascular surgery. And we had several nights where I was up all night with like a 16 hour case where you, you know, 10, 12 units of blood you gave the patient, the abdomen filled up with blood in no time. And in the morning after all this, you didn't take a break to pee all night, you know, 16 yeah. hour case. And, and in the morning, the patient died. Oh, <laughs> you know, and I, I was looking at my mentors, the, the residents, the fellows, the faculty, and they were all miserable. You know, half of them had been divorced by the time they were age 28, you know, yeah, no, <laughs> they tough. were, you know, they were miserable. I said, surgery is the pits. I don't want to do this. Uh, and so I, I, I drifted toward internal medicine for a better part of a year. And then I had a chance to do an ophthalmology residency. I said, well, you know, mom always told me this was a good field. Let's go check it out. And so I went into the OR with much trepidation, not wanting to be in the OR. And there they were. And the first thing I noticed is they were sitting down. 
And I said, yeah. wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a 10-minute surgery, they're sitting down. And I realized it was it was extra caps they were doing. Yeah. And it was remarkable. What you know, that, that incredible moment when you see the lens delivered from the eye. The yeah. brown lens delivered from the eye and you and you put in a crystal clear lens implant. I said, This is miraculous. Yeah. Uh, and that was the standard back then. Now compare that to what we do today. Oh, it's mind blowing. And, it's mind blowing the difference. That's right. I mean, back then, if you got you know four or five diopters of astigmatism, eh, so what? You you know you can you you can still read now. You can you can see again. We can correct it. Now we uh, we talk about a half diopter of astigmatism. We talk about a quarter <laughs> diopter um, yeah. of astigmatism. So uh, so anyway, that was that was the moment that just captured my interest, and uh, I've never thought about any other specialty since. So, and then how, and how did you choose to do instead of pediatrics or strabismus or retina or the, how'd you end up in the anterior segment again? Yeah, I think that the idea of optics was, you know, just was really interesting to me. I, I liked physics and I liked uh, the concept of the way the eye focuses. I, and it may have been partly that first cataract surgery I saw that I said, you know, yeah. helping the eye focus better. So when I was a resident, we were still doing RK and it was, you know, there are not many in, in institutions where residents could learn RK and uh, I, I I didn't do cases as a resident, but I uh, at Henry Ford, where I did my residency, we we certainly had access to those patients, and I was involved in the clinic of Tom Bird, who is a terrific uh, young, uh, trained by Herb Kaufman, uh, mm. cornea guy who uh, you know who who helped me do research on RK in, in those patients, and we you know it was clear that it was a kind of first generation surgery, but mm -hmm. it was clear that that there was something here. Refractive surgery was there was high interest in. And um, and of course, when when the lasers became approved in '95, it uh, it changed everything. So, yeah, that was a game changer. So it's like, yeah, surgeons like you and me, I've never done any RK either, but boy, we were right there at the heyday when LASIK just started. Yeah. So w of all the presents, of all the fellowships, you did a two year cornea fellowship. At the time, there were one year fellowships. So what drew you to that? Wow, two year program, which is now unheard of in cornea. Yeah, you know, nobody's got the patience to do it to you. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there was a, a lot of opportunity to do some research. I got to, to, to delve into that. I found it interesting. I um, had, uh, uh, you know, I liked where I was. And, and most of all, at the time, it was the best cornea fellowship, you know, refractive cornea fellowship. So you got everything in that fellowship. Yeah. You got a deep dive into LASIK. You got a deep dive into hardcore cornea with guys like, uh, Bart Mondino and Gary Holland and and others uh, who you know were, were giant names in the field and um, and plus, you got to do refractive surgery. Plus, you got to attend a residence, which was like an amazing thing for us residents. Uh, Jules Stein is and was such an incredible institution. Uh, such incredible teaching happens not just at, at Stein but also at. Uh, the outlying hospitals, yeah, Atlanta, for sure. UCLA Medical Center, all of you, you know, and all of you, right there. Rest, that's that's your center, <laughs> and you know, the, the you can always tell the residents who are the top oh. people because they're the ones who enjoyed their time most at the county hospitals, right, right. And, and at the VA Ooh. because there they got challenged the most and learned the most and worked the hardest. I was like a donkey. I was like, the more work you give me, the more I'm gonna smile. Right. I love it. Load me up as much as you want. I'll, yeah, it was amazing. So I actually just retired last year. After 22 years, I did 22 years as, as, uh, at all of you. That's 14 chief, yeah. or so as 50 as chief. And uh, it was just an amazing place to teach the residents. I love the patients. The sweetest patients I've met in my life. The nicest staff. The nursing was amazing. And the pathology. These are the patients who have the worst disease. Yeah. And are the most grateful, thankful patients. It's like I couldn't wait to be there every week. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like people who who don't question you, <laughs> who follow your advice, and uh, most of the time, and uh, and and are grateful for for your skills. Uh, that's right. that's for sure what the county hospital is like. It's right. a tough environment because so many limited resources, but uh, such a, a great place to learn. If only my kids and my fellow family members would love me as much as those patients love me, <laughs> I'd be in heaven. But, you know, you can't get everything in life. <laughs> now, one thing I want to talk to you about, too, John, is 
you know, you've done an amazing job of collaborating with industry. Like you're known as if industry has a new product, new technique, new technology, they can come to John Hovanessian and you will tell them straight shooter from the hip. Hey, I love your technology. It's going to be great. Uh, do X, Y, and Z to make it even better. Or you'll say, hey, I like the idea, I like the thought process, but you're not ready for prime time. You need to go back to the drawing board and do A, B, and C. How did you get so involved with the industry? Because to me, you were like the number one liaison between surgeons and industry today in ophthalmology. Well, that's nice of you to say. Uh, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> the folks in industry really crave uh, real-world perspectives from physicians because it's the one thing they lack uh, in their, you know, in their company is is uh, how is this really going to um, interface with, the, you know, the doctor, the intersection of the doctor and the patient, and uh, if we can give that to them in a sort of unfiltered way. It's tremendously valuable to them, and it's really sure. not a unique skill to do that. I think you know we all develop our own biases. Um, probably, what's a little more rare is you know if we can help them to okay, if they have something that's not quite right, how do we make it something that's right? You know, that's going to work for patients. Um, and so, you know, early on in my career, I was a, I was just a few years in, and I started to feel a little bit like practicing medicine was getting a little stale. Um, mm -hmm. like, like, uh, I, I use the analogy to, to driving a bus, you're getting people from one place to another, and it's a very technical bus. It's one that requires a lot of hard won skill, but you know, you're very much repeating the same tasks uh, day after day. And most right. of our greatest challenges in practicing, uh, particularly in private practice are not the clinical ones. It's more of just running the practice. It's running the business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I started to feel a little stale on that. And I, um, I thought about actually going back into academics. I, you know, interviewed for a position or two. And, and then I realized, wait a second, I'm practicing in Orange County, which is the Silicon Valley of eye care. <laughs> There's more yeah. companies doing development here than any place else. And I ought to just start working with them or making myself available to them. And, uh, you know, that started what has been a wonderful collaboration with industry for me and my practice. It kind of started with doing some clinical trials. So, you know, just doing, uh, uh, offering our services to uh, be part of FDA studies. We had Allergan down the road. They always had active clinical programs. Sure. Um, another thing that sort of helped me make a, a name was uh, in pterygium surgery. Um, you, you talked about that earlier. Um, uh, in pterygium surgery, uh, early in my career, there was uh, it was not common to uh, to secure conjunctival grafts with glue. We used to suture them all, right? With, uh, nylon suture or, or vicral suture, and it hurt like hell. And nobody liked doing pterygium surgery because the post op was so unpleasant yeah. for the patient. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I I learned about this technique that uh, was being explored where you use fiber and tissue adhesive to secure the the conjunctival autograft. And I said, what a great idea! I wonder if it works. And, you know, I was d dumb enough, I guess, to, to try it without really knowing. And it worked fantastically. It, it mm -hmm. secured the graft. It was in tremendously more comfortable for patients. It was such a win. Uh, you, you know, it, it, the eyes were quieter and healed better. And, uh, and what I learned is that, hey, here's something that most docs don't know about. And I've done it. And I've got, you know, probably more experience than most people doing. And I started talking about it at meetings, got invited to speak at others. I put together a course for the AAO and the ASCRS meeting. Thankfully, guys like David Harden uh, were, were willing to work with me and Steve Kaufman, who, uh, the, the son of Herb Kaufman, who's uh, uh, in practice now in New York. Uh, sorry, he's actually back in Minnesota. He um, is a real well-respected cornea guy. They joined me in a course. And, uh, and, you know, as a result, I sort of made a name as somebody who could teach. And, uh, and that led to further collaboration with industry. And so now you're involved heavily in a lot of very big meetings, like one of my favorites, Oculus Surgeon New York, OSN New York, which is like a fantastic meeting. You're heavily involved there, but you're involved in other meetings as well. How do you get plugged in like that? You know, so I, I think everything is about building relationships. And when I, you know, if there's a cornerstone of the way I think about working with other people, whether it's, you know, in business or just friendship is how can I best help them? I ask myself, sure. what is it that I can do that is going to make them very successful and, uh, and do it in, in an unselfish way without thinking about what am I going to get out of this? And it turns out that when you do that, 
uh, it, it stimulates other people to have the same sentiment toward you. And mm. uh, they help you to get ahead. And you don't have to try. You don't even have to ask for it. And uh, there's a certain humility in approaching relationships that way that, for me, has just been really gratifying because I, I really do get a charge out of positively influencing, whether it's a company or an individual, to be more successful, to, to get plugged in, to get connected to uh you know, or introduced to, to whoever or whatever is going to benefit them. And, uh, you know, and I, and I think, I think you're very much the same Uday. I've, I've seen you do it dozens of times and, you know, your teaching is another perfect example of that unselfish approach. Um, so when you do that with companies, they recognize that, Hey, here's a guy who, who genuinely wants to help us. He's not just looking for a paycheck. He's not just looking for you know, um, to be well, the, 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 the paychecks and ophthalmic consulting, I better tell the young audience, yeah. have really diminished over time. You yeah. need to do ophthalmic consulting because you love doing it and you want to influence the future of our career, our field, but it's not for the money. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a hobby that um, what it does mostly is make it interesting. You know, so yeah. it no longer became like driving the bus. When you're, you know, doing a first in man type of implant or or just any clinical trial, you're you're breaking new ground. You're doing something yeah. that nobody's ever done before, or maybe a few people are doing with you in different centers. But you feel good about it because now you have something to talk about, you have something to think about that stretches your brain and uh, allows you to offer patients something that, that maybe nobody else can can offer. So, yeah, more, um, more, yeah, of course, more challenges. We're always looking for another challenge. I love that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Exactly. And, and uh, um, we've just had so many of them, uh, you know, different implants that, uh, you know, some of them have been very successful. Some of them have not. Uh, we were part of the, uh, the trial with the, the synchrony lens. Uh, oh, Vizio. I don't even know what Viz that was. The That's Viziogen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the Visiogen Synchrony lens. Remember that lens? It was a dual optic lens. Yes. And it, it had, you know, it was it was meant to be an accommodating lens, and it went inside the capsular bag. You had to have the capsulotomy just right, man. It had to be between five and five and a half millimeters. <laughs> yeah. And if it was an oval in five and a half, you were not putting that lens in the eye, and, you know, because it would sort of flop anterior chamber. And it had legs and arms sticking out in all directions. Somebody said it was like putting a frog in the eye. <laughs> there was, you know, there was an injector, but it, it just, it, it emerged sticking out in all kinds of directions. And yet I'll tell you, the damn thing worked. It really accommodated. It really uh, gave patients a range of vision. And yeah. it was purchased, the company was purchased by uh, then AMO, it's now J&J, &J, and then shelved because they, they uh, did not have a clear pathway to get it through. FDA well, it, importantly, that actually that purchase changed the face of ophthalmology, because if you remember back in the time, for hundreds of millions of dollars, that company was purchased in cash, upfront right. cash. Yeah. And right. so now, after that point, all the companies said, "Wait a minute, we're not going to purchase <laughs> anyone until you're number one already FDA approved, and number two, you already have sales, and we'll yeah. buy your company for a, a, a multiple of future sales." That's right. Yeah, yeah. Earnouts and you know subsequent deliverables became a lot more onerous after that. You know. Yeah, that that one company changed the face of how we do things permanently. Yeah, and it also set a very uh, you know good high watermark for for refractive technologies being purchased. And you know, and I think also uh, it had to be some degree of inspiration for some of today's. Uh, dual optic systems that are being explored. Right, like, like the, the, lens the, lens, the lens Gen Juvene, which That's I right. was the first one to implant ever in Panama in yeah. 2015. It is also dual optic. That's right. And uh, and a fantastic idea. Uh, I, you know, just brilliantly engineered and I'm really hopeful we see positive results from the U.S. trials that are happening now and, uh, and an approval before long. So uh, that's, what, that's one example and there are others as well. But um, you know, being involved in those things, I mean, how exciting is that? Uh, oh, it's amazing. Too. It's um, amazing. And then now that I hit age 50 and I'm really presbyopic, I, I'm thankful every day that I'm a low myope. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, now that I'm presbyopic, I really, really, really want a great accommodating lens to come to market soon. And while I love the lens in Juvene, I, I know there are multiple other horses in the race and I'm hopeful that not just one, but many of those horses will win the race together. Yeah, that's right. 
uh, and the more the better. And, right. and I think that's another, you know, kind of important lesson. Um, for young people who are getting involved working with industry, the idea that you have to root for one partner, for one company, is, I think, wrong. Uh, and it's not good for the ecosystem. We need a lot of companies to be successful. The more companies yes. that have new yes. technologies, the better, uh, because that's going to drive you know each one to be to try to be more competitive, to drive to create something better for patients that that will outcompete the others and ultimately be uh, be you know better for doctors and patients. Um, it's, you know. it's like I say, if I see a speaker on the podium who consults for only one company, a disclosure slide. I think, oh, okay. But if I see a speaker who consults for many companies, I'm like, this doctor is going to be a straight shooter. They're going to be careful, at least. <laughs> well, they get, yeah, because listen, they're not married to any one company, and they, you know, a doctor like that, like, if you have zero disclosures or you have twenty, you're the type of person who's like going to put patients first. And maybe your practice second. Yeah, that's and, right. And, and, and nowhere in about yeah, it. you're gonna put the you want the best for your patient. Yeah, and I think that there's um, there's a natural tendency uh, if you haven't had enough exposure to people in industry except just sales reps to have sort of a suspicion of industry and to 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 put it as a you know it's us versus them that their primary goal is to make money from us and. Uh, anything they can do that is going to be, you know, make the money is is really their primary aim. And that, you know, in in twenty plus years of consulting has just not been my experience at all. Of course, they want to make money. That's why their company exists. But most people who start companies and who work in companies at a high level have the goal of of really moving the, you know, medicine forward. Of of coming yeah. up with innovative treatments that add to patients quality of lives and so they're the truth is they're actually very well aligned with what we physicians want right. to do. and when we work with them and help them they help us and it helps our patients ultimately and so you don't need to compromise one bit your ethics or your you know commitment to patient care to uh, to, to help them be more successful um, well I, I agree with you there I, I definitely put patients first Definitely put, I want the patient to get the same treatment that I'd want for my own eyes, my family's eyes. Sure. But my biggest disclosure, I actually get paid to do ophthalmic surgery. I mean, right, that's my number one disclosure <laughs> by far. Yep. That's and, your primary source of income for sure. Right. And, uh, but, but it's something I love to do. But yeah, I will never compromise my ethics. I'm not going to talk to a patient to surgery. If they, I want every patient to get the same treatment that I'd want for my own eyes. That's the golden rule. I learned that in kindergarten. Yeah, yeah that's right. And of course, it's not the same for every patient because you, you know you, what's right for you might not be right for an individual patient, and we we have to to temper it with that. But the the question really I try to ask is you know knowing what I know if I were this patient, you know knowing what I know about the technology, knowing what I know about this patient, what would be my uh, you know first choice, and uh, mm. to present that option to them, right? Because, that's a because great way. That's a great way of putting it. Absolutely, they don't have our knowledge, and that's why they come to us. So, um, it's. Uh, I think you have learned. You in particular are absolutely brilliant with having. Uh, I won't call them one-liners, but phrases that quickly convey to patients yeah. the sentiment that you're looking for. And I, you know, I don't know whether it comes naturally to you or you work at it, but. So many times I've borrowed so many uh, phrases of yours that I've heard you say oh. to patients, and uh, and and it's uh, it's terrific. It's, it's a good your teaching. Well, you know, thank you for saying that. I, I take a step back from it. and I always think, if I was in that position, so like when it comes to IOL choices, look, I went to med school. I was junior A way. I was A way president. I did really well on the boards. But if I had to have a hip replacement tomorrow, I don't know two cents about orthopedic hip replacements. So if the orthopedic surgeon said, hey, we can do for you this hip replacement, here are the options. You can have this titanium one, I've got a ceramic one, I've got the, the carbide one, the fenestrated one, the Teflon coated one. I don't know. Doc, listen, you're the orthopedic surgeon, given my anatomy, my scans you've done, my needs for my like mobility and my exercise, what, what's best for me? And right. so similarly, with patients, I don't want to give them a list of like, here are the 18 different choices of IOLs and refractive states you can choose. What do you want? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, uh, John Potter, who uh, is a, an OD who has made a career of, of talking to patients who've had challenges with surgery, teaches that um, when you're giving a patient a uh, when you're trying to make a recommendation to a patient, particularly if it's a tense sort of situation, uh, he recommends giving two choices, uh, but but uh, explain why you prefer one. And, I like uh, that. You know, you know, for some patients, it's simple enough to just say, here's what you should do, and they're accepted and they're not questioning. But particularly patients, uh, you know, kind of has borderline trust for, for doctors. Uh, doing that conveys to the patient, and look, there may be 12 choices. But right. you know that 10 of the 12 are not worth considering, yeah, yeah. and all you're going to do is confuse by talking about them. But there, there are probably two that are near the top of the list. And so talk about both of them and say, here's why I would prefer this one. Patients appreciate that you're expressing the complexity of thought, that you, know, mm -hmm. you had at least two choices, and that you thought about them uniquely to, to make one choice for them. And so it's a very powerful way to align yourself with the patient and, and win trust. It's a really simple concept, but it works. It works. You know, Cataract Coach, our biggest fans are, our audience base is off the in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. And I encourage all you young guys and gals who are listening to this podcast, what was just said, rewind this about two minutes. There's so much gold there, you can't believe it. But it's absolutely true. Patients want you for your expertise. You're the eye surgeon who's done umpteen thousand cases, who has such a great expertise. And you, when you put yourself in the patient's shoes and say, well, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Jones, based on your anatomy and your needs for your vision and your measurements and your this, the best choices, there are two options. And here are what the two options are. But for you, I would lean towards this one option. And to give that expert recommendation is gold. Gosh, if I had known this like 20 years ago, it would have made my life so much easier. <laughs> I think you did know this 20 years ago, but but, uh, but we learn it, you know, how valuable it is over time, these things, right. the more you employ them. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the communication with patients is actually uh, really more important even to them. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't realize it, but it's, it's as important as our surgical skill. Uh, they have to establish trust with us. And this is even more true now when you have a patient who's coming in for cataract surgery who is not only making a decision on do they trust you to do their surgery but do i want to spend thousands of dollars on You're a right. lens implant that's optional to give me a result that's not guaranteed <laughs> yeah right and, yeah that's um, true you know and they 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 realize there's risk in it they realize that it's going to influence their vision for the rest of their life and they realize it's a big financial commitment so um we, we owe it to them, of course, to be truthful and ethical, uh, but we won't be successful in communicating with them unless we're real and authentic, you know, in the way we come across. You know, that's a great point. At, at a meeting in the past, you had a great session that you led about how to talk with patients. And yeah. I think that's and, something that's, you know, in, off, in residency we're so, or fellowship, we're so concerned about, like, the technical skill and the this procedure and the that. and the, But sometimes the patient interaction, how to talk to patients, interact with them, is sometimes lost on us. Yeah. Well, and especially when they're complicated patients, right? Uh, those are the toughest yeah. uh, patients because, you know, they're, they're on the verge of losing confidence and uh, we, we need to win their trust. One thing that I love that I learned from you is uh, because you were part of that and i think you taught that this in that session was um and i should let you describe it uh but i'll just introduce it and then you can describe it is uh, is to sit beside the patient instead of sit right. facing the patient uh, tell 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 your listeners about what that means well these are all lessons learned the hard way <laughs> so when you so an example is i have a patient and the staff puts on the, a sticky note on the door of the patient's room this patient is upset. So I'll walk in the room and the first thing I'll say to the patient is, hey, good morning, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Jones. If I were you, I'd be upset. <laughs> and automatically, it's like, wh what? It takes the wind out of the sails. Yeah. And you'll say, yes, here's the reason why. Now, normally we're accustomed to sitting in front of our patients, across from them, face to face. Yeah. But that almost sets up an adversarial position, me versus the patient, the patient versus me. So what I do instead is I'll grab their chart or their printout or their scans or whatever it is, and I'll put that 
in front of me and I'll sit shoulder to shoulder with the patient. And I'll say, here's why I'd be upset if I were you. Because you and I together, we wanted to give you the best possible decision of 2020. And take a look at the scan right here in front of us. Despite our best calculations, our best efforts, a, a beautiful surgery, you ended up minus 0.75. Your distance vision is not that clear. So here's what we're going to do. You and I together, we're going to fix this issue. And we're going to fix it for you by doing some PRK or some LASIK. And it's all included. There's no charge for anything. And don't worry. Even though you didn't heal as predicted, you weren't the best healer, we're still going to give you the outcome you desire. It's a, um, you know, that kind of approach is uh, it, it almost can't fail, uh, right? You know, because human nature is to uh, uh, to defend ourselves when we feel threatened, but also to uh, when somebody sees it from our perspective. When you volunteer to see it from the patient's perspective before they ask you to, uh, you you uh, you automatically create collaboration with them. Um, you know, another great one that's uh, part of that. Uh, Spectrum is uh, I learned from Carrie Solomon is to sit below the patient. So if you're whether you're sitting ah. next to them or facing them, lower your chair. In fact, I always do this when I have the discussion about the IOL. You know, usually their chair is a little bit up. So from when I did this slit lamp exam, and I keep it up there. Uh, you know, but once they get up, I lower the chair, don't fall. But uh, I lower my stool to the bottom, and uh, so that I'm typically below them, and it puts you in the position of a more of a servant. And it puts you in a more trustworthy position because you're not oh. uh, sort of exerting dom you know, physical dominance over the yeah. patient by being over them. That's why I almost never stand when talking to a patient who's seated because it's sort of a, a dominant position. And it's just not conducive to the best building of trust. Uh, isn't it amazing what a difference that can make? Yeah, the subtlety is a body language. Like when, I'm yeah. when you're talking to a patient... Put down the pen, yes. quit touching the keyboard, and yes. just look and talk, be engaged yeah. with the patient. The yeah. keyboard and the pen can wait a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Make riveting eye contact. You know, right. do not take your eyes off their eyes because, you know, that, that builds trust. When someone is looking you solidly in the eye, uh, you know they're telling the truth. And, of course, you, you should always tell the truth. But having them understand that, having them internalize that is a different thing. Um, you know, I think while we're on the subject, I think it's also really important when you got a complicated patient to look forward. I, I love the example you just gave about the patient with a refractive miss. You're not talking about how it happened so much as talking about what you're going to do about it. All right. And, and patients will often bait you into asking why this happened. And it almost never pays off to tell a patient, well, I told you, you know, that I told you this before surgery. Yeah, uh, you want to try to skip over that and focus on here's here's what we're going to do. I want to focus on where we're going to go next, uh, and and that is always a more collaborative discussion. Yeah, these are such golden pearls mm -hmm. that are so rarely taught in residency, and I don't think are in any of the basic science series books. We have the BCSC series of books that we read in the U.S. like three thousand, four thousand <laughs> pages of ophthalmology books. <laughs> I don't think a one talks about this. And this is so critical to everyday practice. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. And I think uh, medical school has, um, uh, you know, we're not selected for med school based in general, based on our, our people skills or our, uh, our ability to relate to patients. And yet that's how we're judged as doctors <laughs> every yeah. single day. The minute you walk in a room is, you know, they're, they're judging you based on how warm that greeting is and whether you seem like a humane person. So. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Johnny Gaden says this, too. Actually, Bobby Osher says this, too. He says, patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just such a truthful statement. And so, um, you know, we, we thankfully, we have their trust. They've come to us, you know, to, to seek our healing. We, we have to constantly earn it, though. And no, so, for, uh, for sure. There's some things that help. Now, in your practice, you're offering the full spectrum of care. So you're doing everything from, let's say, in the, in the refractive world, cat, um, refractive surgery in the cornea, LASIK, PRK, maybe smile, fake IOLs, refractive lens exchange, refractive cataract surgery, plus at the same time any corneal surgery, plus at the same time probably any MIG surgery. You're doing the whole thing. 
Yeah, I mean, I do all of those, and we have docs in my practice. We've got uh, almost 20 docs now, so we wow, the- you know, everything in retina and, and oculoplastics, and, uh, you know, we've got three glaucoma specialists, and, you know, just a, really everything uh, that is at least adult ophthalmology, so it's a... Really fun to work in a group like that because I, you know, I don't have to refer to the retina specialist and wait for a note to come back. I can walk down the hall and talk to her, and uh, that's so cool. Really, it's really fun and very collaborative, and we do all the time. We we consult with each other. Well, today I saw a patient who had acute angle closure glaucoma, and standing outside, uh, you know, just a few feet away is a uh, actually a fantastic retina specialist who you trained, Elaine Wong, sure. who uh, you you told us great things about before we hired yep. her. And boy, is she a go getter and a fantastic doctor. So boom, 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 done. Yep, yep. I'm uh, I'm so glad you uh, recommended her highly. And um, well, how, so it's, how do you... it's fun to collaborate like that. Yeah, how do you keep up, though? How do you keep up with advances in cornea, in MIGS, in refractive, in lenticular surgery? How do you keep up with all this stuff? You know, I think that going to meetings is uh, something that should never die because yeah. y- you, can, you can be absolutely great about uh, listening to content that's available on the web, and yet you miss a lot. Yeah, uh, because to me, it's the conversations I have in the hallway. It's with you know with the guy I'm standing in line with for lunch. Uh, you know, it's the uh, it, it's the collaboration you have over cases that you talk about. It's all the informal stuff that happens at meetings that get that I feel like makes me current. Um, and and the nice thing, you know, the big meetings you you really want to go to because everything's there. It's fantastic. You go to subspecialty day. You're gonna you're gonna absorb everything in you know, cornea or whatever your subspecialty is that you uh, want to observe. But the smaller meetings are a lot more intimate and you get to talk to guys like, um, you know, Johnny Gayton and Bobby Osher and, you know, the and, and Uday Devgan to uh, to get their opinion. You can bring a chart and, and, and ask them, hey, look at this. What do you think I should do with this type of yeah. case? That intimacy is, I think, a great way to get advice and stay current. And so um, I'm going to keep going to meetings, even if they're, you know, are, are great online options. Because I learn, you know, I learn. Yeah. I, I go to teach, but I also go to learn. No, I am with you one hundred percent. It's the it's the person to person interaction that I love most about whether it's an ASCRS academy or a smaller meeting like an Ocular Surgery News, a Hawaiian Eye, that one on one, like at the Hawaiian Eye meetings I've done with you, uh, the, the the Banyan Tree sessions. So yeah. li- you're literally standing under a tree yeah. in shorts and a, and a tank top, probably. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you've Hawaii got and I is the best meeting in eye care for sure. <laughs> and you got twenty of your 20, 30, 40 off the monitors coming up, and yeah. just like talking and discussing that and collaboration, <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes. But or, that or what, right. that collaboration, you just can't get online. Yeah, that's right. And I've tried. Yeah, uh, it's I, I agree with you, and uh, I mean, there's great CME online. There's great, uh, you know, other just sort of news type stuff. I think all of that is great. Uh, CRST does a great job. Uh, OSN Helio does a great, For sure. great job. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing, uh, you know, actually another a, a good one. Let, let me put in a plug for my podcast. I do a podcast with Jim Mazo. Uh, Jim is the uh, former CEO of Zeiss and, uh, and J&J. It was called AMO when he was there. He started AMO. He was the founding CEO of that company that became J&J. And we do a podcast together looking at industry stuff. And so, you know, if you're interested in keeping current with what's happening in the industry, that's a good way to do it. Reading sure. articles in, in publications like Helio uh, and Ocular Surgery News is a great way to do it because a lot of it's there. And it is relevant content. But I don't think there's any substitute to, to actually physically going to meetings and being there. And we have a lot of fun, too, you know. Yeah. So I will definitely put a uh, link to your podcast in the description here below. So any of our viewers, if you're on an audio platform like Spotify or Amazon, Apple, Google, it'll be there. Or if you're on Cataract Coach or on YouTube, just click on the description and there'll be a link directly to that podcast. Thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. But I think it's important. I need to get, in fact, we as as, as ophthalmology in general, we need to get more of the young 30 something year old, 40 something old ophthalmologists involved in the ophthalmic consulting world. This is what shapes the future of our field. Yeah. 
And we've, and we've begun to do that. I, I have been an advocate for more than 10 years to have more female uh, physicians involved, uh, you know, on, on our editorial boards, uh, you know, in consulting roles on the podium. That's happening now. You, you know, it's rare that you see a meeting uh, where there's, you know, three or four speakers and, uh, you know, half of them aren't, aren't women. Because, uh, you know, frankly, um, the profession doesn't look like Uday and John. The profession looks like a mixture of people who are white and brown and, you know, and, and different color skin and different, uh, you know, females and males and from all over the world. And, and I think we're starting to see that diversity in our, um, you know, in our educational programs and our publications. And that's good. That's really good for us. More than half the trainees now are females. Why should they be learning from a uh, you know, a, a podium that's mostly male dominated. That's, that's well, not relatable. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I don't even look at that, but it just yeah. turns out now that you mentioned this, I didn't even think about it. I had my cataract, best of cataract coach course at the ACRS standing room only. I don't know how many 600 people in a room that fit 400 people. And I had two panelists, Rosa Bragg and Mealy from Toronto yeah. and Deepin yeah. Dolly wall from Pittsburgh. Yeah. You're right. They're both female. It's not even why I chose them. I yeah, chose them because right. I think they're A, amazing surgeons, B, they're smarter than me, yeah. and C, they are not going to be afraid to kick my butt and <laughs> teach me in ophthalmology. <laughs> and if you listen to the, the recording from that session, I learned so much. Yeah. Those guys were well, amazing. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's exactly the point is we don't have to compromise <laughs> the teaching or the quality or anything else because there's some really, really talented people uh, that are, you know, both women and men in our specialty. And so, but we need our programs to be representative of who, who the specialty is. And so, yeah, that, that's, um, that's absolutely right. And boy, you know, Rosa can literally kick your butt. Uh, <laughs> she's, uh, she's remarkably fit and, uh, and, and has always been brilliant. So no, she, she's, she is like my twin sister. God bless her. She's the best, Get back. but I assure you, I can bench press twice what she can bench press. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> you've been, you've been bodybuilding lately too. So, uh, so maybe. it's just, it's just fun stuff. Now, let's, let's talk about international meetings. So I've also seen you, you've had a good presence on international meetings. What, is there an incentive or reason for U.S. ophthalmologists to go outside the U.S., go to European meetings? I just got back a, a few weeks ago from the Brazilian Catacorphractor meeting. Earlier this year, I was in Asia at the APAO. Is there, what's your feeling on doing international meetings? Oh, it's just, it's outstanding. You know, it's um, not only is it uh, great to visit these other cities that are, you know, in beautiful places and have a, a reason to go there professionally, but you learn about what's coming in the future. You learn about technologies that we don't have here in the U.S. Uh, you, you learn about stuff we probably shouldn't have here in the U.S. <laughs> uh, that, that is an easier pathway to approval in other countries. You kind of scratch your head and say, why the hell would they do that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you meet people who are just like you, but work in very different health systems. It'll give you an appreciation for all the great things we have here in the U.S. And it'll also um, probably inspire you to do some volunteer work in the developing world. Probably my biggest volunteer or my biggest uh, international work now is doing volunteer work. Uh, and I've made trips to a lot of different countries just like you have. Uh, sure. More of my effort now is focused in Armenia, where we have an Armenian eye care project that uh, thankfully was the recipient of the Chain Crandall Humanitarian Award in uh, in 2022 uh, for Roger Ohanesian, who founded it. We're not related, but we have very similar last names. And uh, we have uh, had a, a, a great number of ophthalmologists who've joined us in Armenia, where we do a um, an annual conference in October. And we have some incredible uh, resources that we've deployed for 30 years. We've been working in that country. I, I joined about 25 years ago, uh, the effort, but we have a mobile eye hospital. that's an 18 wheeler with an, it's like Orbis, but on wheels. Wow. Uh, that, that travels through the country and uh, has an operating room and has laser rooms and has, uh, you know, there's a whole screening unit that kind of travels, uh, with it. There's, um, we've got five regional clinics and we've got a, a whole eye hospital that we support in the capital city of Yerevan. And so hundreds of thousands of surgeries we support. There are whole residency program and uh, fellowships uh, with docs who've come to the U.S. And, and some have done local fellowships. And it's really, it's incredibly gratifying to see how you can take your knowledge from the U.S., put it together with a little bit of work and coordinating with capable doctors in another country and really multiply the number of lives that you can benefit, yeah. you know, by, by doing international work, right? You've done it. You've been to Asia a number of times. Yeah, I've, I've done it. I've done, gosh, maybe 15, 18 of these international 
cha- kind of charity trips or mission trips. I need to do this Armenia trip with you. I gotta, I gotta put that on the calendar. Maybe this year or next. I think it'd be an amazing time, especially now that I'm an empty nest, but my kids are grown up and gone. Yeah. Well, it would be you. well I, I can tell you, you know, so this is a great story is that, you know, last year when we were there, we, we set up a beautiful wet lab. Uh, Alcon and Pfizer actually had the resources to donate this world class wet lab that we have in Armenia. And uh, we, we did a nice program with Matthew uh, Wade, who's on uh, faculty at UC Irvine, came to teach uh, um, skills with me. And, um, and and the residents were talking about, uh, you know, where they what they've learned is we were talking about uh, capsulotomy. They said, well, on cataract coach, uh, they described <laughs> how to do a proper capsulorexis. And, uh, and, I, said, and I, I couldn't help but laugh because I said, You're like, I trained that guy. He's, yeah, that's what I trained the guy. I just, you know, he's my good friend and he's, uh, he, it's incredible the reach that you have. And so, Uday, they would they would go crazy if you visited them. You'd be like, it'd be like the Beatles visiting, you know, the ophthalmology hospital. Uh, I, Armenia, I, so. I, listen, I, I'll take it. I think it'll be an amazing time. And I think, the, as you said, you can do so much good. And you multiply your efforts. Instead of helping one patient, you teach these surgeons who will help thousands of patients. Yeah, that's right. It's a, a hugely impactful. So um, we'll, we'll get you there, Katara coach. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I will take it. See, so, you know, another, another thing I'm asked is a lot of young ophthalmologists, uh, Katara coach skews younger. I don't know if we have a ton of 70-year-old fans on Cataract Cook, but we certainly have a huge number of 30s and 40-year-olds up to age 50. There are a lot of older ones, too, but I think that's kind of our main base. What advice would you give people like this? Because you're solidly mid-career. You've achieved so much in so little time. What is the kind of pearls of wisdom for the young ophthalmologists who just finished training and maybe in the first couple of years of practice? how to maximize your enjoyment and your impact from your practice. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, took me a while to realize is that, uh, and I was, I was given this advice in my fellowship, but I didn't understand it until later, is um, that you should, uh, you know, there's a concept of, of um, uh, do, have, and be, um, which means that you have to do a lot of things, a lot of surgery in our case, to have a big practice. And once you do that, you will be somebody who's uh, a highly accomplished surgeon, right? Ah, that makes sense. Do have be. That's the way most of us think about it, right? But in fact, it's not the way it needs to be. You can have the opposite, which is, well, and and you knew this intuitively, but a lot of people don't. I didn't. Um, You know, it's really uh, be, do, have. It's, you, you need to start your career with the confidence that you are going to be, you know, I, I, this doesn't mean cocky. This means um, present yourself as someone who's genuinely committed to your patients and sure. who is confident in your skills and who uh, knows that you will do the right thing, whatever it takes for your patient. And uh, and they will recognize you as somebody who, who already is an accomplished doctor, is an accomplished right. surgeon. And you will, as a result, you know, uh, do more procedures and, you know, do the things that will lead you in the direction of having a, uh, you know, a, a large and successful practice and a career that is what you want it to be. It's, it sounds um, a little bit, um, but in fact, I think that the idea that you, you start out with confidence that, look, you're somebody, you've, you've trained and you're sure. ready to help your patients. And if you're really enthusiastic about what you're doing, uh, don't be afraid to, um, you know, act just a little bit like uh, like a big shot, and uh, and in fact, that's what you become. Again, this doesn't it, it it doesn't work to be cocky. It doesn't work to be arrogant. That nobody likes that. But uh, you know, be confident in your skills, and uh, you'll see that the most successful people kind of do this naturally. It it's certainly yeah. you know what I've seen from you know in you from the time you were a first year resident. You were a guy who hit the deck running. You know, you had this enthusiasm that. Um, you were going to be very successful and very top notch. You were committed to to doing things the right way. You had curiosity and uh, didn't mind, you know, taking guesses at things where you might be wrong. And uh, and as a result, you learned tremendous amounts about your field and you gained tremendous experience. And 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 look, you became who you are. That is true. You know, I always think of it this way: a failure 
and a success are both on the same path. Yeah. You're on the path to become be, you know, better at what you do and give better care to your patients and be a better surgeon. And on that path, there'll be some successes, there'll be some failures, but everything is moving towards that journey of giving your patients the best. And so as long as you learn from any misstep, instead of a mistake, it becomes more of a lesson. In a sailboat, uh, the wind doesn't always take you in the direction you want to go. And yet you have an idea where you want to go. And so you have to tack, right? Tack and right. keep going you know, left and right around the direction of where you want to eventually go to get there. And life and our careers are a little bit like that. You find a niche, a place that you know you can you can be busy and successful, and you explore that for a little bit, and then you you alter your course a little bit. Ultimately, you end up being successful, but it's because you you know you did it through a series of approximations rather than a straight course. None of us makes a straight course from the beginning of our careers toward where we want to be. Uh, it always takes some experimentation and and frankly sometimes a little bit of failure. So you're embrace right. It. Yeah, right? you know, it's a, you're, you're absolutely right. Like the, the saying goes, the path to success is paved with a lot of little failures. Yeah, absolutely right. So um, it's it, it's something we shouldn't be afraid of. And uh, so often, you know, I think that we raise our kids to uh, to think that, you know, you've got to know what your life path is going to be. And it's just the best things in life were not planned. <laughs> right. You know, they're, they're the stuff that just happens along the way. It's the opportunities that arise. And recognizing them, recognizing, hey, this is somebody who could be a terrific mentor to me. Or, hey, here's a surgical technique that I could really use in my practice, even though I, you know, wasn't, wasn't something I came here to learn uh, at this meeting. Um, those are just tremendous value to us, and we, we need to be open to them. Right. And if you are an ophthalmologist or an ophthalmologist in training, You've already beaten some incredible odds. Of the in the U.S. of the three hundred and seventy-ish million people, one percent or less are physicians. Yeah. Of the physicians, maybe one or two percent of those are ophthalmologists. I mean, still to this day, there are only four hundred fifty, four hundred sixty ophthalmology residency spots for the entirety of our country. Yeah, yeah, we're really small specialty and. Uh... And actually shrinking. <laughs> right. What we do is important. We need to keep keep our eyes on that because it's going to change the way we practice. That's a whole other topic. But it's, uh, yeah, um, we're a small specialty. And that means um, that we're also, you know, a place where anybody really is accessible, uh, whether they're an ophthalmologist or in, in a company. And um, and there's a lot of opportunity. You know, anybody can access opportunity. Anybody can be successful. And anyone can go almost anywhere because there's there's need for ophthalmologists uh, all over the world, and, and yeah. especially here in the U.S. Well, that's another good point you bring up is that everyone's accessible. I've emailed many ophthalmologists whom I don't know out of the blue asking for, can I get your input on X, Y, and Z or your advice on this? A hundred percent of the time, yeah. I get a reply that says, sure, happy to help you. A hundred. Yeah. 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 If you've got the right email address and, uh, you know, or phone number, <laughs> chances are you're going to get a response. Most people are happy to help. And it's, and that's, I, I think that's not just because you're Uday Devgan and everybody knows you. I think it's because people want to help each other. But, but, no, but even back then, even 20 years ago, when I was yeah. in absolute no one, yeah. I, I think, and even today, you get the same as me. I get emails every day from off the malls in the community yeah. across the U.S., across the world. I get emails from off the malls across the world every day. I reply to 100% of them. Sure. And if, oh, if, yeah. if, if you were able to, to by, bypass my spam folder and make it my inbox, <laughs> I promise I'll reply. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, and, and I, I try to do that when it's physicians who are even not ophthalmologists. I'm, I'm sure you do the same because occasionally you'll get an email from somebody. Usually they're asking about advice for themselves or a family member sure. from far away. And they've you know read an article you published or you know have an idea that you, you may know a little more about a subject. I think we... Uh, we all try to help each other out, um, but, but but the accessibility of people in our field is uh, is another great asset. I, you know, as, as I was saying, I think that most specialties are as collaborative, and you know, an, a good measure of that, a good yardstick of that, is if you talk to people in industry. There are a lot of folks who have worked in you know big companies, say J and J, where they're in eye care, but they're also in neurology and they're in spine and cardiology, and people transfer from different units of their company. Uh, to uh, you know, to take opportunity, but very often once they land in eye care, 
they'll never leave eye care. You know, they may they may leave J and Z or whatever company you know that they work for, but they'll stay in our specialty because it is such a nice specialty. We're we're blessed. I don't think any of us picked this specialty because we you know we knew that at the time. Most of us would have no idea, but but it is true. And uh, one more reason that we're blessed to be in this this field of ophthalmology. Yeah, I want to reiterate that that on the industry side, we both know dozens, if not a hundred or more people who work on the industry side. They're non-ophthalmologists, but they work in eye care, work in ophthalmology. And when they have advanced to a certain degree in company X, they'll go to company Y or company Z, but they'll still be in ophthalmology. Yeah. So they're mm -hmm. the same people you've worked with in different companies, but it's the same person for 20 years. Once right. they enter ophthalmology, they're not going to cardiology and ortho ever again. No. <laughs> Especially those two. <laughs> not to pick on our colleagues, but yeah, those two are not, you know, neurosurgery as well. You know, not, not a lot of happy people there. Yeah, no, ophthalmologists, we're, we're blessed to be ophthalmologists. So what, what, what words would you give these young people? Young guys starting training, obviously, they're, the world's your oyster. Yeah. But what, what are some important lessons that, you know, you would tell your, yourself when you were 30, 31, 32, 33 years old? When you enter practice, um, a, a, a couple things. First of all, go and live where you want to live. Uh, if there's a mm -hmm. reason that you, uh, you know, have a, a, you've got family or some other ties to a particular part of the country, even if there's not a job there, move there, and take whatever kind of work you can do, even if it's not. Even if it's, you know, a day a week here, a day a week there, cobbled together a living, you, you know, when you're, you're used to being a resident or a fellow, you don't need very much money <laughs> mm -hmm. because you've been living on a, you know, a paltry salary all these years. But being in the location you want to be in is going to afford you opportunities to when jobs do become available. And don't be afraid to knock on the door of ophthalmologists who are in that community even if they haven't advertised a position, even if they've been in the same practice with one person for decades, very often people want to hire somebody, but they just haven't gotten around to posting a position. Mm. But if they meet somebody who looks nice, you know, you you may well have a job that you found yourself. In. And and they, they didn't know they were going to offer you a position, but but they meet you, they like you, and, and you could be part of their future. And the odds are, you know, you're not going to stay there. The first job you get out of training, 60% of the time, it's not where you're going to stay long term. But uh, but it's going to put you in the place you want to be. I get calls probably once a year from a colleague who lives in another city who's close to our age, Uday, mm -hmm. who says, you know, what would it take for me to set up practice there in California? And I say, well, do you want to be uh, my junior associate <laughs> 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 at this stage in your career? And it's... It's not that I want to take advantage of your situation. It's that I don't, you know, I can't bring you in as a partner when you don't have a practice to bring. If you're moving from out of state, it's pretty hard to do that. You know, maybe yeah. in retirement, if you want to just work a little bit, maybe we could find a place for an experienced person. But, you know, you really should have solved this problem at the beginning of your career, before you yeah. set down roots, before you got married, before you bought a house, before you had kids. Because once you do those things, it becomes much harder to move. Um, yeah. So... You know, find the place you want to be and, and you'll find the opportunity just by being there. Uh, so that's probably the biggest bit of advice I'd give somebody starting their career. Oh, I, uh, love, another, yeah, I love that? that. I love that. Yeah. Another is learn something new every year. Learn, you know, one or two major new skills or features that you do. Uh, make a point of picking it out and even map it out. You know, say, hey, in, in, in 2024, I'm going to learn DMEC if I'm doing DSEC or I'm going to you know, learn the next uh, the thing. I'm going to incorporate femtosecond cataract surgery or, you know, use Zepto or, you know, pick something that's new that you find exciting. You want to bring it into your practice. It doesn't have to be highly costly. It doesn't have to take a lot of effort, but it's going to keep you fresh and make you excited about what you do every day. Uh, those things will make it that much more rewarding to go to work every day. Oh, I think that's a fantastic bit of advice because if you think back, you did a two-year cornea fellowship. You know what you you know what you didn't do in those two years? Lamellar transplantation because it didn't exist. You didn't use a femtosecond laser because it didn't exist. Yeah. You didn't do topo topography guided uh, yeah. eczema ablations because it didn't. None of this existed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Never used an OCT. Never, you know, no, no anti veg app. I mean, yeah. all these yeah. things came later. So you've got to be able to teach yourself. So I love that advice that every year, make sure you keep up with at least one or two new things. Keep advancing your skill set and your knowledge base. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy practice so much more and you you won't reach a point where, you know, we all know colleagues who haven't done this. And, yeah. Uh, and it's kind of notable. Uh, you know, there's there's a few people in every community like that. And uh, you don't want to be that guy or that gal. <laughs> no, that's that's, a, that's very true advice. Yeah. If, here, here's your warning to yourself. Think to yourself, am I operating the same way I did 10 or 15 years ago? If so, yeah. ding, ding, ding. You, you got homework to do. You better get your, your skills up to date. Yeah. Yeah, if I were if I were a patient and I had to pick who to see for the person that I treat most commonly, would it be me, <laughs> or would it be somebody else who's maybe doing it in a modern, more you know, advantageous way? So, yep, yep, we we owe it to our patients to to stay current for sure. And then the the new things that are coming down the pipeline. I mean, we both work with industry now. There are some amazing yeah. things that are in the pipeline. Hopefully, fingers crossed, they're going to be in our in our armamentarium in the next couple of years. But wow, yeah, and and you know that's true regardless of what part of eye care you're in. <laughs> you know, right. whether you're in retina, whether you're in cornea, whether you're in glaucoma, whether you do something else. You know, we uh, all of our specialties have pretty incredible uh, new developments. I, I think it's. Super exciting. We now have uh, injections for dry macular degeneration for the retina specialists. That's a geographic atrophy. Be, geographic atrophy. That's just now beginning. Um, you know, it's incredible. Some of the new modalities and MIGs that we're seeing, you know, lasers, both eczema lasers and femtosecond lasers are going to change um, MIGs. We, you know, it may become an office procedure, sort of like SLT is. Uh, new medications, new ways to deliver medications uh, like iDose from Glaucose and other technologies for uh you know for delivering glaucoma meds uh it's exciting uh, just tremendous and and of course the new lens implants and in, in cataract surgery we talked about the lens gen and sure and there are others as well so so does, so does this mean does this mean you're not going to switch to neurology neurosurgery or orthopedics <laughs> you, you say it ophthalmology yeah you know it's amazing how similar <laughs> some fields are to the way we did practice 25 years ago no. We are not one of those. Yeah, we no, it's an amazing thing. Well, well, I want to thank you, John. What a pleasure to talk to you. Your breath of fresh air, so much good inspiration from this podcast. I know our younger audience will love this and learn so much from it and be driven to achieve so much in the ophthalmology world just like you have. Well, thanks. It's a, a real pleasure to join together with you on this and to, to be part of your teaching anytime I... Uh, get to uh, work with you today it is always just so refreshing and fun and uh just to see the way you approach everything you do i admire you tremendously and i wish you a lot of luck with this podcast and with everything you do thanks so much john good to see you my friend thanks for enjoying that podcast with me with dr john hovanessian i'm sure you learned a lot and really enjoyed hearing about his experience in ophthalmology please leave us a comment below or send me an email let me know what do you think about the podcast so far? Who would you like to have featured as a guest here? And we will do our best to book it. See you next time.